Okay, um, good day class. Um, I, how you all doing? I hope you're safe in your various houses. Um, uh, today we are going to be talking about the femur as a bone. The last class we talked about the gluteal region. The class before it we spoke about the, uh, the bone that looks like uh, the uh, scapula in the upper limb, and that's the pelvic bone. And remember I said that the pelvic bone is, uh, uh, we imagine the pelvic bone to be made up of three beautiful sisters, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And, uh, and I told you that they joined at the middle to form the acetabulum. And remember I said they are going to be getting married to a very rich man. To a very rich man, okay? And remember that the rich man they are supposed to get married to. I said it is the femur. Okay? Why did I say the femur is the rich man? Well, I'm not the one who says the femur is the largest. But I'm just using the word the rich. This is why the femur is very rich. In fact, in terms of length, the femur is the largest, is the longest, and actually the largest, in fact, the, the, the heaviest bone in the body. It has a length of, I think about, I, I, I know it's about 48 centimeters, and that's about 18.9 inches. It has a diameter of about 2.3 centimeters, and that's about 0.2 in, 0.9 inches. And that means it's, then it's very heavy. I think the, the weight is about 260 grams. So, and apart from that, you know, the, the, the femur has, forms a joint with the acetabulum superiorly, then the tibia inferiorly. So since it moves body weight from the hip bone to the tibia when in upright phase, it means that the femur can actually support 30 times the weight of an adult. What this means is that if you, you're standing, you can actually carry 30 people and the femur will still be able to uh, hold you guys. Well, um, being a long bone, we all know he's a rich person. Uh, so let's talk about it as an individual. Well, being a long bone, you know it's going to have a proximal part. It's going to have a proximal part, a, dist a, 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 a shaft, and of course, a distal uh, part. So we are going to be talking about the proximal part first. So I am going to be making use of the labeling so that this whole um, image will not be filled with red ink. Now it has a proximal head. It has a in the proximal part. It has a head. It has a head. It has a neck, and it has two things that looks like the tuberosity in the upper limb. But this time around, we are not going to be calling them the greater and the lesser tuberosity. We are going to be calling them the greater and the lesser trochanter, the trochanter, the greater and the lesser trochanter. So. Let's talk about them individually. Let's talk about the head. The head of the femur actually makes, makes up the two-thirds of its round nature. And it is actually covered by a cartilage. It's covered by articular cartilage. Except for a small part in the middle called the fovea. Or what some people will call the pit. Okay? This is actually for the ligament of the head to pass through. And you know the ligament of the head actually um, uh, gives passage to artery of the epiphysis of the head in early life, actually. Now, it has a neck, too. It has a neck. Now, this neck is actually trapezoidal. And it has a superior part that is narrower than the inferior part. The superior part is narrower, while the inferior part is actually... Uh, broader okay so let's clean that up it has two brothers okay it has two brothers we are going to be calling that trochanter it has a greater trochanter and we are going to we also have a lesser trochanter so let's talk about the smaller one first okay <laughs> let's talk about the smaller one first uh the actually the lesser trochanter is conical and rounded in nature and it extends medially from the posterior medial part and gives attachment for the iliopsoas muscle. Remember, the, the iliopsoas muscle is actually a muscle, so it's actually made up of two muscles that, that, that actually came together, the iliacus and the psoas uh, 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 major muscle. That's why we have it as the iliopsoas. 
Remember the iliac, uh, 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 iliac fossa in the ili I ilium? Well, that's where the iliacus uh, is coming from. Now, we also have the greater trochanti here. So let's have a greater trochanti here. Actually, the greater trochanti is bigger. It's actually larger than the lesser trochanti. Okay, and it is laterally placed and extends superiorly and, of course, posteriorly. And it gives attachment for abductor muscles. Abductor muscles, A, B, D, abductor muscles. And you know abductor muscles from uh, previous uh, classes. We mentioned gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and the tensor facial latter. Well, the greater trochanter also gives attachment for rotator muscles. And you know, we have two types of rotators. We have the lateral rotators and we have the medial rotators. Well, the lateral rotators are actually, the, let me refresh your uh, memory. The, we, have, we have the piriformis, the superior and inferior gemellus muscle, the obturator internus, the quadratus femoris, and the obturator externus. Then we have the medial rotators. We have the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, the tensor facial letter, the ab adductor brevis, that's the ADD, adductor brevis and longus, and adductor uh, uh, magnus. Okay, but uh, let's not worry about uh, this uh, uh, muscle, actually. Now, before we talk about the next in line, which is, okay, let's use this. We have the trochanteric crest. Just see the trochanteric crest. The trochanteric crest is actually, is just a ridge. It's a rough ridge. It's, sorry, not trochanteric crest. Intertrochanteric crest. Some people call it trochanteric crest, okay? So intertrochanteric crest. So it's actually a prominent uh, 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 um, uh, is actually a, a prominent smooth ridge that joins the trochanti posteriorly. Don't forget that this is the posterior aspect of the femur. So this intertrochanteric crest joins the two trochanti posteriorly. There is another one that joins the. There is another ridge that joins the. Uh, 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 the two trochanter is anteriorly. It's called the intertrochanteric line. Let me show you before we come back to this. Um, uh, uh, okay, just hold that thought. I will still show you because most of the information that we want to talk about is here in the posterior aspect. So let's not move. Just know that this intertrochanteric uh, uh, crest, okay, here joins the two uh, trochanter posteriorly. But if you view this femur anteriorly we are still going to be having something that looks like it, this too that joins the trochanter anteriorly okay so uh that's the trochanteric uh, intertrochanteric line and the intertrochanteric uh, 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 uh crest okay let's talk about the um the spiral line the spiral line as you can see here the spiral line as you can see here is a smaller ridge and a continuation of the intertrochanteric line. So it is a continuation of the intertrochanteric line. The intertrochanteric line is coming here. So the uh, the spiral line is a small ridge that is a continuation of the intertrochanteric uh, 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 the, uh, line. Then we also have um, uh, what we call the uh, quadrate tubercle. The 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 quadrate tubercle is just an elevation. See, the intertrochanteric crest has an elevation at the mid part. This elevation has a name, and the name is called the quadrate tubercle. So, the intertrochanteric crest, intertrochanteric uh, crest has an elevation called the quadrate tubercle, and it also has a continuation inferiorly called the spiral uh, line. Well, well. That's good. So the greater trochanter, the intertrochanteric crest has an elevation, the quadrate tubercle, and also has an extension inferiorly called the spiral line. Well, the greater tuberosity, or sorry, the greater trochanter has a depression. It has a depression at the base of the medial surface of the greater trochanter. Okay, there's a, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a depression there called the trochanteric fossa. So around the trochanter, we have mentioned the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, the intertrochanteric crest, the intertrochanteric line 
anteriorly, then the spiral line, which is a, an inferior continuation of the uh, of the interchartery crest, then we also mention the quadrate tubercle, which is an elevation at the central part of the intertrochanteric crest. Then I also mentioned the uh, trochanteric fossa, which is a, a, a deep depression at the base of the medial surface of the greater uh, 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 trochanter. Uh, well, um, uh, now that we have, done, we have done justice to the superior part, the proximal part, uh, let's deal with the shaft. Let's deal with the shaft. Actually, um, uh, the shaft is actually convex anteriorly, and um, we don't forget we are viewing the posterior. This is the, actually the posterior view of this bone, okay? Uh, so anteriorly, the shaft is actually um, uh, convex, and it gives origin to extensors of the knee. But let me not bore you with this muscle. Now, what, I, what is the first thing we are going to see in the posterior aspect? Uh, there's something called a spiral line. The, the, no, sorry, the, I will talk about the spiral line. There's something called the, 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 the linear aspera. The linear aspera is supposed, well, the, the labeling is not here right now. The linear aspera is here right now, okay? So the linear, there's a linear aspera. The linear aspera spelling, that should be L-I-N-E-A. A S P E R A. That's the linear aspira. It's actually a vertical ridge, really, located posteriorly, and it provides a neurotic attachment for adductors of the thigh. We'll get to that later. I don't want to bore you with this muscle. Adductors. That's the A D D. Adductors of the thigh. Okay. It is actually prominent in the middle third and has a medial lip and that continues as a narrow, rough spiral line. So. Uh, uh, oh, oh, what I'm saying, in essence, is that this uh, this uh, uh, linear aspira has it continues superiorly. It continues superiorly to join. Remember the uh, the spiral line that is a, a downward continuation of the intertrochanteric crest. Well, the uh, linear aspira also have uh, a, a, a a part. It also have um uh uh. uh uh, uh, it has a, a medial leap that continues with the spiral line, okay? It has a medial leap that continues with uh, uh, the spiral line. And of course, it also has a lateral leap that blends with uh, uh, the broad rough gluteal tuberosity, okay? So there's a gluteal tuberosity here, but we are still going to talk about that, okay? So uh, this is the gluteal tuberosity here. So the uh, the linear aspira, which is supposed to be here, has a medial lip superiorly and a, a, a lateral lip superiorly. So the medial lip is actually uh, 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 sorry, the lateral lip uh, blend with uh, the gluteal tuberosity, while the medial lip uh, blends with uh, the uh, the spiral uh, uh, line. Okay, we also have something called the pectineal line. The pectineal line. There's also something called the pectineal line. It's actually a, a, a prominent intermediate ridge that extends from the central part of the linear aspira. It extends from the central part of the linear aspira to the base of the lesser trochanter. So it is actually a little bit inferior uh, to the uh, to the spiral uh, line. So it's a prominent intermediate ridge uh, coming from the central part of the uh, linear aspira down to the, the lesser brother, that's the lesser uh, uh, trochanter. Then we also have the um, supracondylar uh, line, okay? We have the supracondylar line, okay? Okay, yes, I can, uh, okay, uh, I forgot to show you. I can see the lateral leap of the linear aspira and the medial leap of the linear aspira here. So one goes here, one goes here, okay? One goes there, one goes So we have the medial leap. Uh, and the lateral leap, the lateral leap and the medial leap there. Okay, so uh, of course they extend um, uh, down. Okay, uh, okay. Sorry, I wanted to talk about the supra condylar line. It's actually located at the lower shaft, and this is formed by the medial and the lateral division of the linear aspira. 
So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that the linear spiral is located here. Superiorly, it has a lateral leap, it has a medial leap. The lateral leaps joins with the superior line, while the medial leaps uh, blends with the gluteal tuberosity here. Now, inferiorly, the lateral line becomes, the, sorry, the medial line, the medial uh, leap becomes the uh, medial uh, supracondylar line, while the lateral leap becomes the uh, lateral uh, supracondylar uh, uh, line. Okay, then we, of course, we have the, the femoral condyles. What we have here, we have a medial condyle and it has, we have a lateral condyle. We have a medial condyle, we have a lateral condyle. Don't forget, we also have the epicondyle because the supracondylar line, we also go ahead to lead to what we call the uh, medial epicondyle here. Okay, just like we have the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle of the, of the uh, humerus. We also have the medial and the lateral epicondyle uh, here. Then we have the, uh, the medial condyle and we have the, the lateral condyle. As I was uh, telling you, they are actually both separated posteriorly and inferiorly by a depression called the uh, intercondylar fossa. Okay, let me clean this up so that we won't have a lot of red ink here. Okay, so um, it is separated. These two condyles are separated by depression here called the intercondylar uh, 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 fossa, actually. Uh, but the merge anteriorly is only separated posteriorly by this intercondylar uh, fossa. But they actually merge anteriorly. Uh, and once they merge, they, they, they create this shallow longitudinal surface called the patella surface. And this is for articulation with the patella. Remember the patella, one of the sesamoid bone in the body? Well, we will talk about uh, this big boy uh, when we want to talk about the, the knee joint. So um, uh, this uh, condyle, this tibia condyle uh, and the uh, menisci actually forms the uh, the knee joint. They have some information of the knee joint. So, but now let's not bother ourselves with the menisci. Okay, let's just bother ourselves with the tibia. The uh, let's just bother ourselves with the uh, femoral condyle, which is the medial and the lateral uh, condyle. Okay, so we have done justice to this uh, uh, bone, really. Uh, but what we have not talked about is uh, the, uh, I, I, I promise to show you. Uh, the intertrochanteric line, that's the anterior part of the femur, so that you'll be able to appreciate the other side of uh, the intertrochanteric uh, crest. Okay, so uh, uh, this bone, let's talk about the ossification. Uh, there's something some texts don't uh, bother talking about, the ossification. Despite being a rich man, despite being a rich man, the femur is not the most senior. <laughs> it's funny, I know, right? Uh, the, the femur is not the most senior. What I mean by that is that it is not the first long bone to start ossification. It's not the first long bone, to, and you know ossification is ma like maturity. So the femur is not the first long bone to start ossification. Remember that little bone in the neck, or when we're talking about the first bone we talked about in the upper limb, that is the clavicle. Yes, yes. It is actually that little guy that takes the crown, really. So the femur is not the most senior. The, the, the clavicle is actually the first long bone to actually start ossification. So, um, but let's not uh, bother about that. Well, actually, the femur ossifies from five different centers. It's ossified from five different centers, uh, but the process starts in the shaft in the seventh week, okay? It starts in the shaft in the seventh week, then in the head around the six months after birth, then... The, sorry, sorry about that, the head, actually, uh, the head, okay, uh, that's around the six months after birth, then, then the greater tuberosity, uh, the, sorry, the greater trochanti, I think that's about uh, in the fourth year, why the lesser uh, uh, trochanti is actually uh, in, in, in female, it is the twelfth year, while in, in male, I think it's, uh, some texts will write 13, some will say 14. Okay, so let's just have it at uh, 12, uh, uh, 14, uh, 13, 14th year in male. 
Then the lastly, uh, then we now have uh, not lastly actually not in that order. Then we have the distal end. That's about the night moon really. Okay, the distal end. That's the night moon. Now, um, what you need to know that is important is that the epiphysis actually fuses independently. It means that the lesser trochanter soon after puberty, followed by the greater trochanter. Then we have the capital epiphysis that fuses in the 14th year in females and the 17th year in males. Then, uh, of course, let me not also bore you with all those, okay? It's just uh, it's okay for us to know about this uh, anatomy, basic anatomy of uh, uh, the humerus. Then there's another knowledge that is actually very important. Of course, I know this is a general knowledge that we've we kept on uh, talking about in class. Now, knowledge of the side of the growing end of a long bone. It is very important. I keep saying this all the time. It's actually very essential for, uh, you know, uh, applied anatomy for clinical application. Take for example. Remember uh, when we said that uh, uh, above the knee amputation in children is might not really cause any problem, but when you amputate the child in above above the elbow, then the upper the humeral upper epiphyseal line could continue to grow and the elongating bone may push its way through the stump and requiring reapportation, okay? So uh, you have to bear in mind, how do you know the growing end of a long bone? Well, the truth is, the direction of the slope of an artery of the nutrient foramen of a long bone points away from the growing end of that long bone. Okay, so uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, 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 the nutrient artery actually points away from the growing end of that long bone. I kept on saying this in the class. And remember that phrase that I, I even uh, had uh, to set in your uh, mock exam and in your first in course. I said, uh, uh, I remember the, to the knee I grow, from the elbow uh, I flee. Okay, so it, it is another way to actually know the growing end of a long bone is the epiphysis of the growing end of a long bone actually is actually the first, I think, the first to appear and the last to fuse with a diaphysis except the upper, the, the, uh, except the upper part of the fibula that does not uh, uh, appear first. Okay, let, let's not bother with this knowledge, okay? Just bear in mind that the growing end of a long bone is actually important. Let's not bother with uh, 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 that uh, uh, knowledge. Now, there's also something that we need to bother with okay let me before i move on let me uh show you the spiral line you know i promise to show you uh, uh sorry the the um okay let me clean this okay let me clean this remember i promise to show you uh the intertrochanteric line anteriorly so we have the intertrochanteric line anteriorly there Okay, so uh, there's something I want to uh, uh, share with you. There is a mathematical positioning of the head and the neck of the semo. Remember, I told you it, it, it's amazing how uh, the, the, the body is created. It's actually an act, an, an act actually. Uh, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Um. Uh, I think this, okay, look at this, look at this, there's an angle formed by this really, right now, okay, we have this, and we have this, now, it's called the angle of inclination, the angle of inclination, the angle of inclination is actually between, I think between 126 degree uh, to about 128 degree in adult, really. Now, it is formed by the meeting of the axis of the shaft, the axis of the shaft, with the long axis of the neck, with the long axis of the neck and the head, of course. Now, in other words, the long axis of the head and neck is superior medially at an obtuse angle to the shaft. Okay, so it's superior medially at an obtuse angle to the shaft. Now, this angle is more in newborn. I think it's, a, it's greater than 130, 135. I think 135 in newborn. However, it will remain lesser in female because of the increased width between the acetabulum, 
due to wider pelvis. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about later. Women tend to have wider pelvis, okay, and the obliquity of the shaft. So this angle is actually lesser in females. So you expect this angle to be higher in male. Now, this mathematics is actually very important. Why? Because it makes sure that the head and the neck are more perpendicular to the acetabulum. Hence, it permits mobility of the femur at the hip joint. So this angle actually helps the stability of that joint. So that is why this mathematics is actually very important. But you know, just like in every relationship, one, one person must actually, you know, bear the brunt. Okay, it's actually, uh, this relationship is, uh, is very important in, in bipedal walking. You know, you know, the early men actually walked on, on four legs, okay? They walked on four legs, and later on, uh, then they, there's now bipedal walking. But just like someone actually will be a bit the bronze in this relationship, okay? This angle is actually important in bipedal walking. We've already said it, and it actually helps stability of this joint. But there's a problem. Uh, the neck, in all this union right now, it is the neck that suffers it. <laughs> it is the neck that suffers it in this union, okay? Because um, all this effort actually imposes... Uh, a lot of strain on it, and it might actually lead to its fracture. Uh, that's why you notice most of these things in older people, especially when they have the osteoporosis. Uh, uh, there's also another um, knowledge I would like to uh, share, another applied anatomy I would like to share with you. Um, let's speak. There's a lot of them, but because of time, I will only be sharing. Uh, okay, so there's something called Cosa Varga, Cosa Norma, and Kozavara. Now, the Kozavara, let's talk about the Kozavara. Um, let's clean this up. Our red ink is <laughs> messing up everywhere. Okay, um, uh, let's talk about Kozavara right now. Kozavara is when the angle of inclination, remember the angle of inclination is the angle, an obtuse angle between the neck and the, uh, or axis between the neck and the head, between the, uh, uh, the, the shaft of the humerus and the neck and the head, of course. Okay, so uh, now if this angle is actually uh, 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 decreased to like 110 degree, uh, between 110 degree to 120 degree, we say the person is having Kozavara. Okay, so what this does is that it will limit uh, abduction of the hip since... Uh, it shortens the lower limb, of course. So, you know, once this angle is uh, lower, it will shorten the lower limb. So, definitely, it will cause uh, uh, passive, uh, it will limit a uh, passive uh, abduction of the hip. But when this angle is actually increased, that is when it is more than uh, the, when it's more than 139, 140 uh, degree, we call it this Cosa Vaga, okay? And this might actually be altered, by a lot of things, it might actually be caused by a lot of things like age, sex, diseases, and uh, so many things. Even, even, uh, okay, let's just leave it at that. Okay, so in short, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, Kozavara is when the angle is increased, while uh, Kozavaga is when the angle is actually decreased. But this is actually normal here. Okay, so um, we have come to the end uh, of this class, and um, uh, in our next class, we are going to be talking about how muscle attachment to this uh, bone came to be. Okay, so uh, um, stay safe. Okay, wash your hands. Remember to wash your hands. Stay safe in your house. Okay, so no matter how uh, boring everything it is, e e everything is right now. Uh, things are going to be changing very soon okay so wash your hands regularly stay safe okay don't go anywhere stay in your house okay okay so all right you guys should take care of yourself thank you